Jimmy K here, Metal Voice. Look at this. The Metal Voice shirts are now on sale. Just go to the video description to find out on how you can purchase one. Metal! Welcome to the Metal Voice, Alan. Who do we have? One of our all-time favorite guests, Mr. Wolf Hoffman of Accept Himself. All right, look at that. I'm not wearing, hold on, I'm just putting off my jacket here. Lot of nations. Get comfortable, Wolf. Don't worry. I am. I indeed, indeed. You like my background? <laughs> yeah, it's a live, it's a, like, artillery. It's a live shot. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Too Mean to Die, going to be released January the 15th on Nuclear Blast. I can't even believe this, Alan. The 16th studio album. How about that? Where has the already, time gone? Already the fifth one with Mark Tonello. Crazy, <laughs> isn't it? I mean, yeah. where's the time gone? Here's, here was the first one, Blood of Nations. The last wow, thing I remember is you. Nice. I like it. Got your <laughs> swag and everything. <laughs> That's right. All right. Well, tell us about the album. Tell us about the album. Well, brand new songs in the traditional form of Accept and Better Than Ever. What can I tell you? And it's got a whole bunch of stuff on it, which surprised a lot of people. I've heard the comments that it uh, reminds them a little bit of Blood of the Nations as far as the vibe is concerned. And the other comment I got that there's a lot of um, surprising variety on this album. So yeah, I would agree are, with that. Yeah. Yeah. I and see I was your, oh, go ahead, Alan. Go, go ahead, Jim. I, I see there's a lot of that more classical, neoclassical guitar work in it as well, injected into it more than usual, I would say. Yeah, and some of that is just coincidence because we really just go with the ideas that we have and they kind of take a life on their own. And, you know, we let the, all of a sudden you have these songs and there's your album, but it was never planned that way in a, in a way. You know, you kind of, when we start recording and writing songs, we never have a, a goal or a plan. This is what we had tried to achieve and we must do this, we must do that. We just basically follow where the songs take us. And that kind of shapes the album in the end. All right. So I was trying to place together, you know, some of the changes that were happening. I've been listening to the album and wow, Wolf is really hot. There's great guitar leads. And I thought it was just one guitar. I thought it was just you on the album. Then I find out there's three guitarists in the band. That's right. And we have a lot of the solos and not a lot, but quite a few of the solos are played by Phil Schaus on this album. We just, because now we have a third guitar player and right. um, th that happened also coincidentally because we were doing an orchestra tour last year where we played all over europe with an orchestra uh, we played material for my solo albums and a bunch of rearranged except classics and then it was a wonderful experience and on that tour we had the guitar player by the name of phil schaus with us and after the tour was over uh we thought well it would be a shame if we would never see him again if we send him back home and that was it <laughs> Because we really got along great, and he's an amazing player and a nice person. So we thought, hey, there's no law that you can't have three guitar players in a band, right? Yeah, well, it, works, I mean, it works for Maiden. It works for Maiden. <laughs> so, you know, we were not really thinking about that when we decided that, but hey, there it is. So, you know, the, you got Zombie Apocalypse, it starts off with, and you got Too Mean to Die, which is, I think is one of your heaviest songs in, in years, it seems like. But it just sounds Good. like it's fresh. Yeah. And I don't know why that is. It just came out that way. And I'm glad that yeah. it did. But like I said, these things are hard to hard to predict or to plan or else everybody would always plan <laughs> everything to be wonderful and it would turn out wonderful. But it, it, you know, it just sort of happens automatically or it doesn't. So what were the pros and cons of releasing during a pandemic? You know, a lot of people, a lot of people would say, I'm going to wait until this is all over. You know, because I'm scared the sales might not be there or we can't support it on tour. I mean, what's the yeah, thought well, process? What's the thought process? Ask me again in three months and I'll tell you <laughs> <laughs> how good of an idea that was. Honestly. <laughs> I mean, in one way, in one way, you're kind of like alone, right? Because there's not that as many albums. But in That's another true. way, right? Well, well, the other thought was, you know, heck, first of all, we don't know when everything is going to go back to normal, if ever. So how long do you postpone everything? And is it really such a good idea to let the album just sit there in the, in the archives until day X, which may or may not be anytime soon? 
Or is it maybe better to give the fans the album out now so they can at least enjoy the music and then when the day comes, we'll see each other on tour again, you know, so it's, it doesn't have to coincide with the tour. And I, I mean, it just makes sense when it can, but when it can't, then, you know, I don't know. We'll try different ways. Right. No, and there's going to be a, a lot of people we're interviewing to say, save your money because when, when we're allowed to start touring again, there'll be shows <laughs> scheduled for every city, probably back to back. There's so yeah. much uh, been delayed. So. What about so this might actually help. I mean, in a weird way, there's also the thought that it might help album sales because people don't have their, you know, don't have to buy a gazillion tickets right now because they can't. So maybe more people buy the album. But any, at, at any rate, it is what it is. We decided to go ahead with it. And here we are a few weeks away from it. Are, are so you there. also like writing? Like you're saying, okay, I wrote one album. Might as well just write a second album or in a third album. I mean, there's yeah, ideas. Well, maybe... I mean, if we get really bored, we'll start on a new album. But <laughs> honestly, <laughs> I don't see that happen. I'm a little bit, you know, depleted right now. So maybe I'll work on something else for, for a little while and then go back to it. You can tell how many albums Jim has done, right? Just like a valve for him. It's a valve you turn on and the albums just pump out. Yeah, it's just, yeah, it's an album. <laughs> just, you know, just make it. Like another another make one. It. You finished one, start another. <laughs> <laughs> what about live stream? Do you think that's sort of like the way to go? to promote the album? Uh, hardly. Um, I don't really see that being exciting for anybody. I mean, for the band, it's going to be weird to play in front of a bunch of cameras instead of excited fans. And then for the fans, you know, you're not, you're not there in the, in the middle of the venue. You're not getting that live vibe from the band and you, you're at home. And it, isn't it like watching a video at that point? I mean, uh, a live video. Isn't it? I don't know. I don't really see the point in it, to be honest. All right. And there's drive-ins too, right? Where people drive yeah. in with their cars. In Germany, I know that was kind of popular. Yeah, but I mean, it's so limited. So few, few people can come and then, I don't know. I mean, the people honking their horns instead of <laughs> raising their hands. And yeah, it's just too weird. I mean, I don't, I'll think we'll skip that, you know. <laughs> we'll wait. We'll wait for the tour. Right. I think so. I mean, a metal show is such a unique experience because it, it drives on the interaction between the audience and the band. You know, the better the audience, the better the band, which fires up the audience. So it's this back and forth thing, which I would miss terribly, I think. You know, what, no, and what I mean, about, like, you look, yeah, no. look at songs like Princes of the Dawn, where you got the chanting and a ball to the wall. And this album, you got The Undertaker. There's that classic accept chanting that happens in there that we That's look so right, forward baby. to. That's right, baby. Yeah, we need the audience to. <laughs> We need the audience for that, you know. If we, if it's just a few of us on stage, it's, you know, it's kind of lonely. What about the songwriting process? Okay, like Peter was always there. He's not there anymore. I mean, yeah, did it leave? And it's it was sad not only for you guys but as the fans. You know, it's kind of like, of course, yeah. I mean, how did you fill in that gap? I mean, was it weird not seeing him there by your side like he always has been? It is. It's a little strange for me. And I was kind of heartbroken and sad when it happened. But, you know, at the end of the day, what are you going to do? You have to move, keep on moving and the show must go on. And we've got a great new guy on play on bass. His name is Martin Motnick. And he actually contributed quite a bit to this album, songwriting wise, which really surprised me in a, in a good way. It was great because I asked all the guys, man, please let me hear any, in, any ideas you might have that might work for us. Let's have him. And he really came forward and delivered a bunch of good stuff. So, yeah, I miss Peter. But at the same time, you know, it's almost been two years and the ship rolls on. What can you do? Yeah. yeah. You know, and I guess the fans can decide whether it really influ influenced the album in a bad way or not. But so far, I don't think it has. You know, I think we sound as fresh and as good as ever. So, I, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. I heard the album. Alan's heard the album. And... I would say definitely somewhere between the first one with Mark and uh, Stalingrad, probably right there, right in the middle. Good. Yeah, I've Blood heard that Nations. comment quite a bit where they say it's got a little bit of that vibe of Blood of the Nations for some weird reason. I hear a little Stalingrad there too. Maybe, uh, you know, no. um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe a, it's just a me. A sprinkle of Stalingrad and maybe a <laughs> dose of... <laughs> a little bit of me. A sniff of blind <laughs> rage. <laughs> Exactly. No, but every yeah. every except album, you know, you've got the great production, right? You guys, like you said in the past, we're German. What do you expect from us, right? It's got to be top notch production. You've got the great. Dude, guitars. we're the metal machines. We're too mean to die. You can't kill us. Yeah, you know, <laughs> the Teutonic that's... terror. <laughs> Made in Germany. What are you gonna do? <laughs> exactly. 
you know, and now it's a snake made in Germany, a That's mechanical right. snake, you know, so there. <laughs> all right. How about lyrical themes? All right. If I throw out the names of some tracks, just like 10 seconds on the theme. Yeah. Too mean to die. It's really just a tongue in cheek statement about the times that we live in. You know, we're the metal warriors, immortal. It sucks to <laughs> be you. <laughs> it sucks to be sucks you. Sucks to be you. Use your imagination. I know <laughs> there's somebody in, in your entourage, in your environment, in your imagination that would fit the bill for that song. I'll throw one out there. Oh, the best is yet to come. I love that storytelling aspect that Mark uh, sings about. It's great, isn't it? It's actually been a, sort of a motto of mine for many years. That's actually how I roll. The best is yet to come. It's my honest belief. I think the best, except show hasn't been played yet professionally. And I also think life is full of surprises and the best is yet to come. I'm, op I'm the optimist. And then how do we sleep, which is the opposite of the best is yet to come, right? Yeah, that's right. I guess that's you know, a, maybe a pandemic song. Is that... Well, it's kind of about the world that we live in, how crazy it is, and how how do we sort of ignore all the fact how everything is going to shits out there in the big world. But, you know, sometimes it makes you wonder how we can be so so calm with everything that's going on nowadays. Symphony of Pain, do I hear a little bit of Beethoven in that lead break there? <laughs> you are correct, yeah. my friend. Oh, to there. joy? That's the finger. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> And we uh, decided to actually write that song about Mr. Beethoven himself in the lyrics. So it's about yeah. his struggle with, with deafness and, you know, tragedies in life. And, and overnight sensation, I guess that's the sort of Facebook, YouTube world of clicks and likes. That's right. It's about you guys, actually. Is it? It's, a, it's about the you. <laughs> click, click, click. The click. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's about the YouTube kid generation. You know, the young kids like you. <laughs> like us, like us, yeah. like us. I think you're yeah, only... It's got, really got that 80s feel guitar I found. Uh, that, uh, that Doesn't song. it? Yeah, it does. Yeah. It's yeah. one of my favorites. I think it's going to be a good life song, that one. So let's just quickly talk about Eddie Van Halen. He just passed away. Very, very sad. Did he influence you growing up or when you were playing? or Just tell me about I that. I think he... I mean... At the end of the day, he influenced everybody, I think. And anybody who heard him first was like blown away and thought like, whoa, what is all this? And he opened up a whole new chapter for every guitar player, I think. But um, I, I, I was never personally very influenced by him. Uh, I was more, more drawn to, I don't know, Richie Blackmore and Uli Ross and other players that really influenced my playing a little bit more of the classical European style of playing. And Eddie was, I think in a league of his own, um, but I don't think he influenced my, I mean, a little bit maybe, but he's not one of my major influences. He was like Did Michael said, Schenker, legend. Michael Schenker have any uh, influence on your playing the Wolf? No, also Oli Roth is, is the guy that I adored and still adore to this day. Um, Schenker is amazing too, but, He's, he's different from, you know, I, I don't think he influenced me terribly much. Yeah. What about when you look back at the Accept albums? That album, I really like it today, but I didn't like it back then, or vice versa, or the other way around, or I really liked it back then, but I don't like it today. When you look back at all the music you've created. Uh, to tell you the truth, I wasn't really sure that all the stuff on Restless and Wild would turn out to be such a classic album uh, and there would have been so many classic songs we still play years later. Yeah. It felt like, it felt like interesting and it felt good, but it, I, by no means did I have the idea. And I don't think anybody of us did that it, we created something special or something that would last as long as it did, you know, because it wasn't an overnight, an overnight sensation, by the way, <laughs> yeah. it was, you know, it was just another album. It sold okay, but we all knew it wasn't the big hit that we, needed or the, the big album that would get us you know on the big stages of the world that really happened with balls to the wall so restless and wild was kind of a an underground album or however you would call it but it wasn't a commercial success at the time when we all felt it was not the the best we've ever done or the best we could do so we all we wanted to move forward and that's why we never pursued this whole speed metal thing ourselves because we thought it was fun and it was great and we had, we had a ball doing it, but it wasn't something that really 
influenced us that much. I mean, it was really surprising that years later people told us, oh, that song, you know, uh, uh, Fast as a Shark really changed my life and it made me go into speed metal and all these kind of things that it did for other people. But for us, it didn't really have that impact at all because there was no, no immediate feedback from anybody, you know. No, and I, I'm going back to watch all these magazines from the 80s, Circus and Hit Parader, all these, and I see a, a little blurb from you because in North America, Restless in the Wild was released and then like three months later was Balls to the Wall. You're like, I hope our fans don't expect us to release our albums every three or four months. You know? <laughs> yeah, because it was released later than in Europe, you know, That's right, so they, yeah. they kind of piggybacked it onto each other somehow. Uh, yeah, it was yeah, crazy. Yeah, it almost got lost, lost in the shuffle here in North America. Balls to the Walls came out so much... Uh, uh, you know, quickly after, like you said. Yeah, because we signed we signed a big deal with you know a Sonic, a Sony Epic at the time, and it, that song "Balls to the Wall" and that album really changed everything for us because did, it, did it you got think, us out though, of. Did you think "Balls to the Wall" would be that big one, that big one for the band? When after you finish yeah. recording it, you go, you know, what, this is, is going to be it, or did you feel? Oh, it? definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We all felt. I I, I have the. I have a memory of when that song was written and it really was very fast. We thought, wow, this is really good. This is super catchy and so round and there's really, it's, it's perfect the way it is. I hope it doesn't exist yet. You know, we were afraid we might have just copied somebody else without knowing it because it, it felt so like, God damn, that's really good. Is this, are we all fooling ourselves here? You know? <laughs> yeah. I remember hearing it, Alan, and, and well, for the first time on the radio and I go, what was that? Really, <laughs> I mean, just that feeling. What on earth was that? So whatever you're saying right now, you're describing, it came through over the radio for the first time. I couldn't understand it. I go, is this Judas Priest? Is this ACDC? What is this? Yeah. Why is everybody chanting in the middle? It's just, it was just, just. Well, I, I had, I had gotten restless and wild first. And then yeah. so it was automatic when I was obviously going to pick up the next Accept album, no matter what it was. And then you put that on. You know, I mean, you got London Leather Boys and it's just every song on there is a classic. So. I didn't Winter know what Dreams. Gabby was saying. I, I, I had no idea Dreams. what Gabby was saying. <laughs> I'm reading the lyrics. I go, what the hell is she talking about? That's all right. <laughs> it sounded it cool, matter. but it sounded cool. Yeah, right? yeah. It sounded cool. <laughs> That's pretty much it. Uh, Alan, you have anything? Yeah, but just I want to get back to the album, though. There's a nice surprise at the end with Samson and Delilah. You got that Arabic feel. It's an instrumental, yeah. too, right? At over four minutes. So that's surprising. Yeah, it's it's a song that uh, initially wasn't really supposed to be on the album because it was just another instrumental song that I, that I sort of played around with. I really like doing these sort of things. And it could have very well ended up on one of my instrumental um, solo albums. But Andy was really pushing for it and said, no, we should put it on the album because it's nice and heavy and it's not, you know, overly classical in that sense. It sounds like a metal song, um, but it really is based on two classical themes. Um, you know, one is called Samson and Delilah, appropriately, yeah. by Saint Sons, and the other one is by Dvorak. So, and I just sort of messed around with these two ideas and built that instrumental song out of it. And uh, Andy felt it would round off the album quite well. So that's why we included it. So how, how was the production going in a pandemic compared to all your other albums with Andy? I mean, it was difficult. He was not present. He was over in Britain. You guys had to get back home. Like, Yeah, for some of it. But we had already uh, together worked on about more than half of the songs when this pandemic happened. Uh, so we were about 60% done, I'd say. We just had a few songs to finish up and that we had to do uh, online with Andy. So the, the, we were recording in Nashville, engineering ourselves and recording it properly and whatnot. And then um, Andy was listening in from back home in England and giving us comments and basically producing it from far away, which was a little strange, but it's like this almost, you know, it's doable. You can sort of, you can communicate what you need to communicate. It's, you know, it's it's it worked okay. I wouldn't, so the, I wouldn't, role, I wouldn't, the roles of pro, the roles of producers in jeopardy now because everybody's learning to do stuff on their own. Or I mean, we've been recording, and I mean, I've been recording for years. I I just I wouldn't want to tackle the drum recording and certain things, but other stuff I've done for years. You know, I'm I'm by no means an engineer, but it you know it, I can record stuff. It's it's not a rocket science. <laughs> Mixing, on the other hand, is that's 
you know, that's where the art comes in. It's, and Andy has always done that by himself anyhow. So we usually let him do the mix and he sends us test, test um, <coughs> files to listen to and we make our comments and we'll take it from there. It's no need to be together for a mix really ever because it's quite honestly, it's boring as hell. If you sit next to a guy, <laughs> yeah, because it takes days and listening to the same song over and over again, it's much better if I sit here and get, listen to it with fresh ears and give him my honest opinion rather than sort yeah. of being involved in every little nuance myself, you know? Yeah. How, how would you, okay. For all the fans out there, the except fans who want to know one sentence, describe this new album to them. It's not my job. It's your job. Jesus. <laughs> Why do I? Well, because lazy. you want to entice them. You want to entice them. You want to, you want to get them. Oh no, man. I can, these are all my little babies. I'm not. All gonna, right. Uh, <laughs> all right. So here's, here's, you want to hear mine? I think I already yeah, yeah. told you mine. I think I already told What's you that? mine, right? Let's see. I, I think here's mine. Blood of the Nations with Stalingrad with sprinkled your in. Uh, sprinkled in with a dab, just a dab of your solo album, your classical solo album. All right. I'm fine. So with if you that. like Stalingrad and if you like Blood of Nations and you like your solo album, just mix it all in together and this is what you get. Alan? So you a cl classic except, right? This is what we, we've grown to expect from uh, them. So you got the, the great production, great guitars, great leads, uh, and the chanting vocals, uh, maybe not as, as heavy or as apparent on, on some of the previous albums, but they're there. It's, it's everything you expect from, and great quality. So Awesome. All right. Well, like I said earlier, it's always super hard to predict how an album will turn out. I mean, at the end of the day, it is what it is, and other people have to characterize it. But it was, there was never a grand scheme and we'll, we'll sit there and plan it all out in detail and, and make us an album and just uh, tailor make it like that. It just doesn't work that way. You just write the best songs you can and, and there's your group of songs and that's it. Throw them you out to no, the world to see what throw happens. Throw them out to the see, masses see and let them devour it. And, and <laughs> you know. <laughs> Too Mean to Die release, to be released January 15, 2021 on Nuclear Blast. The sixteenth studio album by Except. Oh my God, Alan, I feel so old. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. Well, you are pretty old, dude. Yeah, <laughs> Not as old as me, but you're still pretty old. <laughs> well, I, I, I didn't mean. I didn't mean that. You're a kid. Oh, it's a fact. It's a fact. We're, we're, yeah, it's we're, fifty-two you know. years old. When I when I when I used to think of a fifty-two year old, I used to think, man, that guy's old. Yeah. Yeah. Well, try sixty, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Wolf, it's always a pleasure to have you on the show, it's, and it's great. Uh, congratulations on the album. It's, it's fantastic, and uh, all the success uh, with the launch of this uh, fifth, 16th studio album from Accept. Yes, sir. Well, thank you very much, guys. It's been my pleasure, as always. <laughs> <laughs>